Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video covers sections 30 to 41 of Husserl's Cartesian Meditations. Up to this point in the text, Husserl focuses on the constitution of objects from the flow of experience. In the fourth meditation, he turns his attention to the constitution of the transcendental ego itself. Like how a variety of perspectives coalesce into a single identical object, a multitude of self-experiences are assembled into a unified ego. Without this, it would be difficult to imagine how any object could form a synthetic unity as there would be no unified ego wherein this would happen. As such, the unified ego is the essential correlate to a unified object experience. Yet, as we'll see, this consideration evokes a question we'll have to consider. If the ego is established from the numerous particular and contingent experiences of myself, how is it plausible then to discover any universal and necessary truths which Husserl sets out to achieve through his phenomenology? Static phenomenology entails a turning toward the flow of experiences, engaging in intentional analysis to uncover the noetic noematic correlation between intentional consciousness and the intended object, as well as the horizons that surround all this. However, such an analysis does not consider the implicit conditions for experiencing the object in the first place. For example, in encountering a cup, I can engage in a static phenomenological analysis, studying the various modes of intentionality directed toward the object, and through imaginal free variation, consider not only its modes of appearing to me, but also those essential characteristics that present themselves and that make the cup a cup, regardless of which perspective I take. Yet for this analysis to be possible, I must have at some point learned that a cup is a cup. I had to be taught what it was for, how it was used, etc. And since I'm not born with this knowledge, I must have acquired it over time through my experiences. In Husserl's terms, genetic phenomenology analyzes the emergence of these conditions. Thus, whereas static phenomenology deals with the finished product of constitution, so to speak, genetic phenomenology uncovers the sedimented layers of constitution and the structural dimensions of their historical establishment as they come to govern our present constitution of things. A key feature to genetic phenomenology is its analyzing how the ego as a concrete individual with its own history and time gets constituted. In sections 30 and 31, Husserl posits a complex notion of this self-constituting ego, which encompasses both the flow of subjective experiences and the entity that experiences that flow. This conjunction of attributes may appear peculiar at first glance. Husserl's conception of the ego exceeds the isolated psychological self that characterizes much modern philosophizing about the ego and instead encompasses the totality of all that appears. This is notably extending Descartes' identification of this ego with the cogito, the I think, to now include the cogitatum, that which is thought. Consequently, the indubitability of the cogito also extends to the contents of its thoughts. Another surprising conclusion emerges in Husserl's notion of the ego. The unified synthesis that is called I is itself constituted out of the flowing life of the subjective processes. This move surprises because it suggests that what comes to be called the ego, while being characterized as transcendental, is itself constituted out of the contingent and particular flow of experiences. Consequently, the ego comprises specific attributes, including its past experiences and acts. This departs from the typical understanding of an empty, universal, pure activity often attributed to the modern conception of subjectivity. Instead, this identical ego is both an active and affected subject of consciousness, one that is both universal and concrete at the same time. Now turning to the question we began this video with, doesn't this contingent aspect undermine the transcendental character of this ego? Well, no, since there is a necessary and universal element contained in this constitution of the ego from the flux of self-experiences. This is what is called the law of transcendental generation, wherein every past act or decision permanently marks the ego with a new abiding property. 
According to Husserl, the ego shows in such alterations an abiding style with a unity of identity throughout all of them, a personal character. The concept of habitualities refers to these enduring acts that generate the ego. In fact, Husserl claims elsewhere that the world itself is the firmest and most universal of our habitualities, and as such, serves as the necessary background by which all other objects in that world may be constituted. From this, Husserl attempts to show us how one's particular history possesses its own transcendental conditions internal to the flux of experiences that governs how it gives rise to a self-constituting transcendental ego. Such a genetic phenomenology is not opposed to transcendental phenomenology, but instead is thought to fill it out with its complex and textured meaning. From this understanding of the constituted ego as consisting of habitualities that makes possible the constitution of objects, we come to discover two ways objects are synthesized by the ego. Active genesis involves using subjective processes to constitute something. For example, when collecting things, the things are already constituted, and one then actively gathers them together to form something new, a pile, a set. At the same time, active genesis presupposes a prior passive genesis. Husserl provides the example of the ready-made object wherein it confronts us as a mere physical thing existing before us. There is an originality of the itself that is given to me before any active grasping of it. And in some ways this reminds me of Heidegger's notion of force structure. Yet even this case of passive genesis suggests its own history that in order to have grasped the physical thing at all, required it have undergone some synthesis by consciousness. And thus, we have to first learn how to behold it as something. Consequently, we should not mistake passive genesis with some sort of complete lack of activity on the part of the ego. Instead, the distinction between passive and active genesis seems somewhat reminiscent of Kant's notion of sensibility, wherein phenomena arise first through time and space to become constituted as objects, the transcendental aesthetic. Only after this, then it's possible for these objects to undergo the judgments of the faculty of understanding, the transcendental logic. And indeed, the role of time in the constitution of objects is considered a primary condition of passive genesis for Husserl. And elsewhere, he'll discuss what he calls hyletic data of sensory matter, which is also a mode through which passive genesis occurs. This distinction between the activity and passivity of the subject is a quite significant one for later phenomenologists, many who prioritize this passivity and rendering it a radical passivity that precedes our ordinary understandings of activity and passivity. Conceptually, has led to such philosophers to prioritize intuition over and above intentionality. There's the elemental materiality of hyletic data as delivering a preconceptual immediacy that grounds all lived experience, and a concept of self that is not first constituting and directed toward things, but is constituted by what precedes it. Passive genesis is governed by the principle of association, which entails a lawful regularity that guides and structures passive genesis. The notion of association, as well as habit, are prominent in empiricism, especially as we see it in Hume. However, as mentioned previously, Husserl remains critical of what he calls Hume's naturalistic distortions of the concept of association. For Husserl, Association here is not principally a matter of empirical laws governing the mental conjunction of randomly co-occurring data. Instead, it's a kind of intentionality governed by eidetic laws, and thus also a fundamental concept belonging to transcendental phenomenology as much as it does to, for example, psychology. It designates what he calls an innate a priori that makes the ego thinkable in the first place. And as such, Husserl is somewhat closer to Kant in this regard, who conceptualized causality as an a priori synthesis of association. Such a principle for Husserl is indispensable for internal time consciousness, wherein retention, protension, and the now moment undergo an associative synthesis whereby objects are constituted. 
Throughout our discussion of genetic phenomenology and the constitution of the ego, we would have seemed to have abandoned the pursuit for a universally grounded science that Husserl sets out as our task in this work in favor of contingent matters. However, this is not the case. He reasserts that the aim of transcendental phenomenology is to uncover the all-embracing laws or universal a prioris embedded in every intentional analysis. He defines the universal as the unconditioned, meaning that matters of empirical fact have no bearing on it and that it precedes all manners of talking about it. This directly opposes a constructivist view of reality or the idea that social and linguistic factors are fully determinative of the truth of something. This move from the purely descriptive to what is essential, Husserl names eidetic phenomenology. Only by developing an eidetic phenomenology will it be possible to establish what Husserl sets out to do at the beginning of this work, which is the actualization of a philosophical science, or what he calls here, first philosophy. Husserl concludes section 34 with a summarizing statement of his argument, which is that along with phenomenological reduction, eidetic intuition is the fundamental form of all particular transcendental methods. Now, I should be a little bit more precise in defining the word eidetic. Eidetics concerns what is necessary and essential over that of issues related to being and matters of fact. The word eidos simply means essence, but Husserl wishes to avoid some of the conceptual baggage that gets tied to the term essence, and so uses the term eidos and eidetic instead. So a question that might come up at this point is the following. What is the relationship between this discussion on eidetic phenomenology and the previous one we just had on genetic phenomenology? What connects these two since, initially at least, it might seem that they are mutually exclusive? We get an answer to this question in section 37 when he claims that the ego is self-constituted in the unity of a history governed by the universal laws of Genesis. In other words, the way in which a passive genesis takes place and makes possible a subsequent active genesis is not a matter of pure randomness and happenstance. There is a logical consistency governing the associations established and the manner by which sedimentations of constituting possibilities are layered. Habitualities acquired, or not, conforms to eidetic or essential laws of association. Just as an overly obvious example of this, one must pass through childhood prior to adulthood, and it's impossible to imagine any variation of this situation. It is a necessary feature of the progressive development of the ego. And we have to, again, separate psychological genesis from this phenomenological understanding of genesis. Similarly, there are such principles governing the formation of all habitualities, principles that can, in theory, be uncovered and which, as essential facts, do not depend upon contingent matters, all of which then come to fall under the domain of an eidetic phenomenology. In light of this inclusion of the eidetic into phenomenology, we can now consider his claim that phenomenology offers a transcendental theory of knowledge, or what is called epistemology. The problem Husserl identifies in all traditional theories of knowledge is that they fail to deploy the phenomenological epoche, wherein everything transcendent is bracketed. Now here we have to be careful not to confuse the word transcendent with transcendental. Transcendental concerns the in itself, the things themselves, as they are encountered in and as consciousness. Transcendent, by contrast, refers to the notion of the in itself as existing outside of the imminent sphere of consciousness, the Kantian noumena, if you will. The positing of the transcendent within epistemology then entails coming to terms with the conditions of possibility for knowledge as it is restricted to the domain of my subjective experience, my consciousness, which is then placed in opposition to an external, transcendent, actually existing reality. From this traditional theory of knowledge, the inevitable question that emerges is the following. How can I get outside my island of consciousness and how what presents itself in my consciousness as a subjective evidence process can acquire objective significance. 
This is the question that Husserl sees this theory necessarily arriving at. In fact, this problem is a rearticulation of an issue that haunted Descartes' own thought, from which these traditional theories of knowledge have their identified start. The problem for Descartes can be articulated as this. I have indeed arrived at indubitable knowledge of my existence as a thinking thing. But now, how is it possible to extend th this insight such that it applies not just to my experience, but to all rational beings? Descartes attempts to resolve this issue by resorting to the idea of God, which he discovers as another indubitable truth arrived at that through his method. And from that point, Descartes is then able to arrive at the conclusion that truth exceeds himself, Descartes, and provides a guarantee that the truths individually discovered in the mind do indeed generalize to other minds and to the world as a whole. However, to even need to try to resolve such a problem requires having perceived myself according to the natural attitude wherein one presupposes the external world as a valid concept before even finding an answer to the question. For this reason, the epoche is needed to bracket such presuppositions. In doing so, one discovers that all of that world I have access to, every kind of being, anything characterized as transcendent, is uncovered only within the ego's field of consciousness. A conclusion that flows from what we've said earlier concerning the ego's identity with the flow of subjective processes. In other words, transcendency in every form is an imminent existential characteristic constituted within the ego. So there is no problem for Husserl concerning the outside world because the outside world is itself given as a phenomenon within transcendental consciousness. Thus, the attempt to conceive the universe of true being as something lying outside the universe of possible consciousness, possible knowledge, possible evidence, is nonsensical. They belong together essentially, and as belonging together essentially, they are also concretely one. One in the absolute concretion, transcendental subjectivity. If transcendental subjectivity is the universe of possible sense, then an outside is precisely nonsense. And even then, Husserl follows up by saying, to encounter nonsense itself also takes place within the sphere of transcendental subjectivity. The ego is not a subject distinct from objects, but the domain wherein objectivity is encountered in subjectivity. And every question I raise that concerns things that take place outside of personal identity still always and necessarily remains within this subjectivity including other egos and the objective world common to all. Husserl then concludes from all this that phenomenology is also a transcendental idealism. Now, idealism is typically understood as the prioritization and absolute existence of mind, consciousness, subjectivity, that is, in a sense, more real than or more fundamental than external material reality. Someone like Kant rejects the radical implications idealism can take, as we find, for example, in Berkeley, but does prioritize the mediated experience of material reality through mental faculties or categories. This transcendental idealism is now here appropriated by Husserl as his own. For Husserl, it seems necessary to consider phenomenology inseparable from transcendental idealism. And it requires a, an appreciation of both the intentional method that leads to rich phenomenological descriptions of transcendental experience and a transcendental eidetic reduction that leads these descriptions to not remain at the level of the particular, but to arrive at the universal and necessary character of their essential possibilities. If you found this video helpful and it's within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below this video. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon, where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. And as always, thank you for watching. And until next time, be well.